Welcome back to Psychological Science. Everything is the way it is because it got that way. That's either incredibly banal or incredibly profound, but either way it serves to introduce the topic of today's lecture, Human Development. How a baby turns into a functioning uh, human adult. Let's begin at the beginning. What kind of babies are there in the natural world? Biologists distinguish between altricial species and precocial species. Now, precocial is related to the word precocious, and it means early developing. If any of you have watched nature documentaries, you have, may have seen footage of precocial species. So a zebra or a wildebeest will give rise to a baby zebra. The baby zebra plops down onto the ground, uh, wiggles a bit, almost immediately gets up on somewhat shaky legs, wobbles a little bit, but within a few minutes, while the camera is rolling, the zebra is prancing around its, uh, its mother. Now, this is what species have to do if they give birth out in the open and they are uh, vulnerable to predation. The opposite pattern of development is called altricial, and this refers to uh, hatchlings or babies that are not quite done. They're kind of brown and serve roles. They need to be finished off uh, out, out in the world, uh, and they can be born quite immature. If any of you have seen uh, baby rodents, such as uh, hamsters or guinea pigs. They are little pink jelly beans. You can barely make out their limbs. They are hairless. They are kept in a nest or a burrow safe from predation, and their mother uh, takes care of them as they grow into uh, recognizable members of their species. Humans are as with, with many traits, a very weird mammalian species, we are sometimes called secondarily altricial. We certainly didn't evolve directly from, uh, from rodents, uh, but uh, we don't resemble the mammals that we evolved most closely from because our babies are born in a highly immature state. Uh, a lot of brain development has to go on after birth, during which time the child is helpless. You could have a baby, you could have some food for the baby that is a few inches away and the baby would starve to death unless there was an adult providing the food uh, to the baby. Our babies are uh, helpless. This is thought to be a consequence of the fact that we are the species with this big bobble head uh, on, on top of our bodies. Uh, housing our large brains, that has to, it has to get through the birth canal and there's only so wide a woman's pelvis can be before locomotion would be compromised. And so the baby is squeezed out when its head is not quite fully grown and there's lots of development of the brain and body that takes place after birth. It's thought that the long human childhood uh, that characterizes Homo sapiens. We spend most of our lives either as children or uh, taking care of children. Is part of the adaptation to the cognitive niche. We are a species that lives by acquired skills and know-how, so we have a long period of development in which we learn all the stuff we need to know to survive as a human being. The first question that you have to ask about development is, what causes it? What does it consist of? How does it take place? And there's more than one way in which a baby differs from a grown-up. Most obviously, we've got a lot to learn. That's why we're born so, uh, so helpless, why our childhoods are so protracted. And clearly, when babies come out of the womb, they don't know much. They, they, they can't speak, they can't walk, they don't know uh, who the president is, they don't know how a bill becomes law. Uh, they, they've got an awful lot to learn. But that's not the only way in which we change over the course of development, because we also biologically mature. The most dramatic example is puberty, when we sprout uh, armpit hair and pubic hair and genitals develop and body shape changes. We don't learn to have armpit hair, it's just something that is governed by a maturational clock that means that certain physical characteristics emerge at certain times in development. It's quite possible that certain of our mental abilities also emerge when a biological clock says that they're ready to emerge. 
We certainly know that the brain of a child undergoes uh, massive maturational changes even after birth. Most of our neurons are formed in utero, plus far more than we need. There is exuberant growth of brain cells in, in uh, the fetus, and many of them die off in early childhood. <clears throat> Presumably this is one of the ways in which organization is imposed on a, a diffuse brain. As in the old joke, how do you uh, sculpt uh, an elephant? Well, you start off with a block of marble and you chip away all the bits that don't look like an elephant. The uh, neural circuits that allow us to be intelligent uh, don't only grow into place, but they also come from pruning neurons and more important, synapses that uh, are not uh, needed to form that neural circuit. Synapses, the number of synapses that we have peak in infancy and childhood, so kids have more synapses than you or I do, and they do so at different rates in different parts of the brain. This is an old diagram that shows by by the neurons that take up a stain, what the density of neural networks looks like at different stages in development. So here you have a newborn, this is a three-month-old, this is a 15-month-old, and you can see the profusion of axons and synapses that develop in the first year of life. This is a graph that shows the time course of maturation in different parts of the brain. The green curve uh, represents the visual cortex, and as you can see in all parts of the brain, there is an overproduction, an exuberant growth of uh, synapses, which then uh, are sculpted into functioning neural networks. It happens first in the visual system. Uh, the kids learn to, to uh, uh, or mature into seeing organisms early on. Their auditory system uh, hits a peak shortly thereafter. Uh, the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that we all know and love that allows us to think, make decisions, plan, inhibit our impulses, uh, peaks later. The brain development is really only in an adult form toward the end of uh, adolescence. So this, the peak for vision is at about at one year of age, the peak for audition uh, closer to three, peak for, uh, of uh, synapses for frontal cortex is more like uh, four or five, and then by adolescence they uh, reach their adult uh, state. Now another major form of brain development, together with the early uh, growth and then die-off of uh, neurons and the proliferation and then uh, sculpting of synapses is a process called myelinization or myelina myelination. You all remember from the lecture on the brain that we've got gray matter and we've got white matter. White matter consists of the long fiber tracts that connect uh, uh, neurons to other neurons or to um, the sensory organs or the muscles often quite far away. The axons are coated with a fatty sheath made of a substance called uh, myelin, and that takes years to develop. That those fatty sheaths allow neural transmission to be much more rapid. Um, here you have the diagram that you saw in the lecture on neurons and networks. These uh, white sausages are formed by cells called oligodendrocytes. They wrap themselves around the axon insulating the axon, no, neuro, no uh, uh, transmission of ions across the membrane can occur in the part of the axon that's covered with the sheath, but there are little gaps between them, which means that the electrical signal that passes along the axon actually uh, jumps from gap to gap, and that process is much more rapid than if it had to ooze its way down the entire length of the axon. So the myelin sheath is important to rapid, efficient neural conduction, and it's not all there when you're born. Uh, indeed, the uh, different parts of the, uh, uh, the brain and nervous system get myelinated at different stages in development. The frontal lobes uh, come last. In fact, the frontal lobes are not fully myelinated until late 
uh, teens, early 20s, which means that human beings pass through about a 10-year period in which they are sexually mature, but don't yet have the neural circuitry necessary to control their emotions uh, and, and their impulses. And I think of that as God's little joke on parents. Now, what about new neurons? Are we really born with all of the neurons that we will ever have? A rather depressing uh, thought. Uh, when I was a student, I don't know if this is still considered true, but we used to snap our fingers like that and say that every time you s that I snap my fingers, one of your neurons uh, dies. And it was believed at that time that there were that no new neurons were formed. We now know that that is not correct. That the hippocampus continues to uh, uh, generate new neurons throughout life, and these neurons help to form the scaffolding that consolidates new memories. But in the cortex, although it is not known for sure, most of the neurons um, are uh, the ones that you were born with. That is, there is not a turnover of brain cells, or at least not neural cells, in the same way there's a turnover of, say, skin cells, probably for a good reason, because it is the pattern of strengths of synapses that encodes memories. If your brain cells were to die and get replaced by uh, new brain cells, they would not retain the pattern of synaptic strengths that encode memories, and so you would be amnesic all, all your life. Now, learning and maturation are not the only two ways in which we can uh, mature, in which we can change. There's also a mechanism known as a critical period, or a, sometimes a sensitive period, which means that the, as the nervous system matures, there is a window of time in which learning of a particular kind can take place. Uh, too early and you're incapable of doing that kind of learning and then when the window starts to shut you lose the ability to learn in that way thereafter. It's uh, more often called a sensitive period because it's not as if you wake up on a Tuesday and suddenly you can learn then a couple of years later the third Thursday in October all of a sudden you can't. It's more like uh, it, it, uh, uh, the window gradually opens and then it uh, kind of tapers shut toward the end. The most famous example, perhaps, is the discovery by the ethologist Conrad Lorenz. He won a Nobel Prize for this and other discoveries in his famous studies of goslings, baby geese, where in a critical uh, period of development, between 18 and 30 years after hatching, they will imprint, they will glom onto the first large moving object they will see, and thereafter will uh, follow it around. Now, ordinarily, the first large moving object that they see 18 to 30 hours after birth is their mother. But if an ethologist removes the mother and inserts himself in their place, you can get goslings that are imprinted on an ethologist and will uh, follow him around as if he is their mother. But only uh, after 18 hours post-hatching and before 30 hours. Of course, as the cartoonist Gary Larson notes, this can go horribly uh, awry, and here is what happens when imprinting uh, studies go awry. Now, are there critical periods in human development? There is a widespread belief that there is a critical period for the acquisition of language. We all know that uh, uh, if you begin to uh, use a language early in life, you end up uh, most often more fluent, making fewer grammatical errors with less of an accent. You can see this in immigrant families where the children will um, become indistinguishable from native speakers. Their parents will struggle with the language all their lives. The kids will often uh, make fun of their parents' grammatical errors. My uh, grandparents who came from Eastern Europe uh, learned English in Canada and when my uh, mother and her two brothers would correct them, my uh, grandfather would get angry and say the eggs are teaching the chickens. That's not the way it should be. But the eggs do teach the chickens when it comes to a skill that has a critical period early in development. Now, it's not so easy to actually show what the critical period in language is. And uh, there is still controversy. And the, our best answer seems to be that it depends on which aspect of language you're talking about. Now, in the previous lecture, I divided language into different components, including 
uh, syntax and morphology and the lexicon and phonology. And one of the advantages of understanding that language is not one thing but is built out of a number of components is that they seem to have different sensitive periods in development. So phonology, the sound pattern of language, what we informally call an accent, probably uh, starts to decline shortly after the age of two and even people who learn a language in um, middle to late childhood can often be saddled with an accent. Uh, at the other extreme, the mental lexicon, our knowledge of words and their meanings, a subdivision of declarative memory, of semantic memory, probably does not have a critical period. We learn words all our lives. Every time you're introduced to a new person, you are learning a word, namely their name, uh, when you learn a new street name or a new name for a new uh, gadget or character in a, uh, a TV show, you're uh, continuing to learn vocabulary and the peak may be around 50, meaning that as your memory starts to decline in general, that's the only time at which your ability to learn vocabulary items declines. Now for syntax and morphology, combining words into sentences, combining uh, bits of words into words. A study that I published a couple of years ago with Joshua Hartshorn and Joshua Tenenbaum uh, was the first large-scale study that, to establish when a critical period for the core of language, syntax and morphology, might be. It began by accident. We put a language test on the web, uh, 100 items of uh, word choice and agreement and idioms. And the idea was this was, would identify your accent. What variant of English you spoke? Do you speak uh, New England or Southern or New York? It's not clear exactly why people would have to take a quiz to know what kind of English they speak because they know what kind of English they speak, namely whatever part of the country they grew up in. But for whatever reason, it went viral and we got two thirds of a million subjects. That's a lot of subjects for a psychology study. And so we were able to plot out uh, for the people who learned English as a second language, how well did they do in the test, depending on how many years they were at it, but more crucially, when did they begin? Did they start speaking um, the, 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 their English as a, their second language pretty soon after they were born or later in childhood or adult, adulthood? And here's what, it, what we found. Over here, you have the uh, average for monolinguals, for people who uh, only speak English, and it's a tad better than the uh, people who learned it as a second language, the bilinguals, but not that uh, different if they started closely after birth. Uh, but then you can see that it, well, there's a slight decline in childhood, but it really kind of starts to fall off a cliff uh, approximately at the age of 12. So these are immersion learners, which means that they learned English as a second language, but in a milieu of other English speakers. They, were, they used it in everyday conversation. For people who learned it in the classroom or in um, uh, 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 other kinds of formal instruction, they not surprisingly uh, did not do as well on our test, but they, their ability declined earlier in life, probably around nine years. Uh, so there is something about having to use English in a social setting just to make friends, influence people, get your job done, that keeps the uh, sensitive period of language open a few years later than if you are learning it under the more restricted circumstances of uh, lessons or uh, some other formal uh, situation. In a couple of lectures from now, I will talk about the development of personality, but in the rest of this lecture, I'm going to concentrate on cognitive development, how we learn to think. And it's an opportunity to introduce another of the big thinkers, the grand theoreticians in the history of psychology, in this case, a Swiss gentleman named Jean Piaget, who like Freud and Skinner and Chomsky was, had a vision, a grand scheme of how the uh, domain he was interested in should be studied and, uh, and organized. Piaget had a number of uh, themes, many of which 
continue to be widely held by scientists of cognitive development. The first is the metaphor of the child as a scientist. That, Like a scientist, the child is surrounded by empirical phenomena, things uh, fall and fly and make noise, and the child is trying to make sense of it with theories, in this case unconscious intuitive theories. Piaget, moreover, believed that children are pretty intensive experimenters. They observe the effects of manipulations of the world and they formulate intuitive theories to explain them. The it all begins with a infant uh, developing little mental programs or apps, which Piaget called schemes. A scheme is a motor program with an expectation of what will happen as a result. So for example, there may be a, a raise block scheme, uh, which consists of first of all, grabbing a block with uh, your hand, lifting your arm, and the expectation is that the object will levitate. That's a, a, a raised block scheme. Now, cog cognitive development begins with the child uh, chaining and embedding these schemes as the child acts on the world. So for example, uh, the scheme move block can be composed out of the scheme raised block, the scheme move arm and the scheme drop block. And the expectation is that the object ends up at a new location. Not surprisingly, but if you're an infant, that is a, uh, a revelation. That is a step in the path of cognitive development. Now, of course, we uh, aren't babies. We don't just raise blocks and drop them and throw things off our high chair table. Uh, we change and Piaget proposed there were th three mechanisms by which schemes can develop into the, the complex thinking patterns of an adult. There's assimilation. Some things work. You try them on new objects and they work the same way they did with old objects. He called that assimilation. Experience conforms to a scheme you already have. Accommodation is when you change one of your schemes uh, if the result that you expect is not what happens. Uh, you've got to change something. And then there is a somewhat mysterious process that he called reflective abstraction, where a scheme goes from concrete, invo involving a motor program, to abstract, a conceptual program. So for example, the scheme raise block might be reflectively abstracted to a scheme for increasing the quantity the concrete particulars get kind of sloughed off, but the abstract logical structure of adding to something resulting in a increase in its quantity gets distilled out and it becomes an element of thought. So thought emerges, according to Piaget, from motor operations on the world combined with expectations of results. And with the chaining and embedding as in uh, coding a software program. Piaget is probably most famous for proposing his developmental stages. And this is just something that every psychology student has to learn. It is a rite of passage of the uh, Psych 1 uh, student. The idea is that the development consists of pretty discrete stages in which all of the child's schemes are characterized by certain pretty abstract mathematical and logical properties, resembling the ones of self-contained mathematical systems that you may have learned in algebra. For example, the natural numbers support the operation of addition. They also support subtraction, which reverses the process of addition. They obey laws like associativity and commutativity, uh, that is, uh, 2 plus 3 gives you the same result as 3 plus 2. 2 plus 3 plus 5, well, if you add the 2 plus 3 first and then add the 5, or if you uh, add the 3 plus 5 first and add the 2, you get the same result. Those kinds of very abstract uh, properties Piaget proposed applied to across the board to language, to morality, to manipulating physical objects, to social uh, awareness, and so on. 
And this table, taken from your textbook, works through the four stages. The first one is called the uh, sensory motor stage. This is, uh, spans from birth to about two years of age. During this stage, the child is kind of a stimulus response creature. He, uh, there are not much in the way of actual uh, ideas or thoughts, but the world is a bunch of objects that can be manipulated and then uh, perceived. Now, a number, Piaget had a pretty detailed chronology of what happens during the sensory and motor stage. It's divided into a number of substages, which I will uh, uh, not work through. But uh, there are milestones that the child reaches during these two critical years of development. One of them is object permanence. The idea that objects continue to exist even when you, they are invisible. Piaget proposed that a uh, newborn and a very young infant is so captivated by the world of sensation that if something uh, is no longer visible, it may as well no long not exist. It doesn't exist. A, a simple illustration is you show a child a pretty toy, the, to the child is absolutely entranced, put a hanky over it, the toy is invisible, the child suddenly the child loses interest, it's as if the toy never existed. The uh, attainment of object permanence, that is when the child uh, first tries to uh, remove the uh, the uh, hanky looking for the object which the child knows is still there uh, occurs later and it is related to other feats of development during the stage such as stranger anxiety, the uh, distress that a child will exhibit when an unfamiliar adult walks into the room. Before the child reaches that, uh, that milestone, um, one person is as good as another. There is uh, nothing to be afraid of because an adult is an adult is an adult. When children start to differentiate adults and realize that if one leaves and another one comes in and the other one is a stranger, then they uh, start to freak out. Uh, th this typically occurs in the second half of the first year of life. They also have separation anxiety. If they are uh, left by alone by, by a parent, Prior to six months, it's just, well, who knows, things materialize, they disappear, uh, there's no rhyme or reason. According to Piaget, at the point at which the child has the idea, there are things in the world, like mom, and uh, if I'm not seeing her, that means she left me, and um, I better kick up a fuss to get her back. That requires having the concept of a mom that is distressingly not there when you can't see her, you want her back, uh, that crucially depends on some kind of uh, permanence. Between two and around uh, six or so, you have a stage called the pre-operational stage, where the child now is no longer a, uh, tied to stimuli and responses, to motor programs and expectations, but the child has mental representations. In particular, words and images. But the uh, child though, uh, even though they can think of things when they are not there, thanks to these mental representations, they're not really organized into structures akin to those mathematical systems where if you add, you can subtract, if you can multiply, you can divide, if you multiply by one, nothing happens, if you divide by itself. That whole system of interlocking operations is not yet in place. Here the child knows there are things, the child does things, but they're, uh, they're kind of disorganized. With the ability to represent, to hold things in mind as mental representations, you have the ability to pretend. The child might uh, pick up a banana and pretend that it is a telephone. The child has a, uh, a concept of a telephone which is separate from their perception of the uh, banana. But there are, because the various schemes and oper are, are not organized into uh, interacting sets, the child is subject to a number of infirmities, including egocentrism. The child cannot conceive that the world is any different to someone else than it is from their own vantage point. This is quite literally true, as is shown by the three mountain problem. You have a 
tabletop with uh, three mountains arranged in a kind of a triangle. Child is sitting over here, the uh, adult is sitting over here, and you ask the child, what does it look like uh, the, the experimenter says, what, is it, what, what am I seeing? What does it look like from where I'm sitting? Do I sit? And shows the child a number of pictures with the three mountains in different orders. And the child, during this pre-operational stage, subject to egocentrism, will pick out the arrangement of mountains that corresponds to what the child herself is seeing. It doesn't occur to the child that the world from someone else's vantage point, from someone else's perspective, differs from their own. Uh, then, at uh, starting around seven, which in many cultures is the age at which kids are uh, sent to school or put to work in the fields, if, uh, in, in uh, cultures that, that don't have formal schooling, but where the child starts to um, take on some of the functions of, uh, of an adult, you have a stage called concrete operational, which means that now the different um, uh, operations that the child commands are organized. The child knows that one can undo another, that performing an operation will change some things, leaving others conserved or unchanged. Uh, as your textbook puts it, thinking logically about concrete events, grasping concrete analogies, and performing arithmetic operations. And among the accomplishments of the uh, concrete operational uh, stage again, famously, this is something that is has long been part of the psychology canon. Is the cognitive feat known as conservation, which is to say, uh, when uh, an object changes, not everything about it changes. Some things are conserved. The most famous example being the conservation of liquid or the conservation of uh, volume. Uh, you show the child two beakers filled with colored liquid. And you say, which one has more? The child has, uh, says, well, they're the same. Now you pour the liquid from the uh, short uh, fat beaker into a tall skinny beaker. And you say, now which one has more? And the child will say, well, now this beaker has more because the level has risen. The child is, um, his child's head is turned by the increase in one quantity, what, namely uh, height or one attribute, what the child has not yet been able to do is, first of all, to, to note that the increase in height is compensated for by the decrease in width. So those two different perceptual qualities are not um, put into a relationship where one can trade off against another. Nor does the child know that the even as shape is transformed, uh, volume or quantity is conserved. This is a, an accomplishment of the concrete operational period. You can try it out if you've got younger uh, cousins or sisters. This was uh, such a uh, common demo for students to take home and try on their families that according to legend, uh, one uh, a student tried it on a family member in Cambridge, and the uh, kid said, oh, uh, I don't want to do that. Try it on my, my brother. He's got conservation. Uh, whether or not that story is true, this is a classic uh, demonstration of the change that occurs around the seven-year uh, boundary, and uh, it is uh, pretty replicable. It's one of many examples of conservation as a feat that comes about during the concrete operational Phase. This too is from your textbook. Uh, number comes to be conserved during the concrete operational period. So you give, show the child two rows of pennies. You ask which one has more. The child is satisfied that they're the same. You spread one row out. This sounds unbelievable, but it's really true. Now you, say, you ask the child now which row has more, and uh, the child will. Uh, before the concrete operational period, will say the lower row has more during the concrete operational period, we'll say, well, it's the same number of pennies, you just spread, spread them apart. And then there is conservation of substance. You've got a ball of plasticine, and then you roll it into a snake, uh, and one of them into a snake, you say, now which one has more? And they will point to the one that's been rolled into a snake and say, that has more, as if it uh, mysteriously managed to grow stuff. Uh, it works with a five-year-old, does not work with an eight-year-old. The uh, Calvin and Hobbes strip had some fun with uh, that, where Calvin says to Hobbes, want to see something weird? 
Watch, you put bread in the slot and push down the lever. Then in a few minutes, toast pops up. Wow, where does the bread go? Hobbes says, and Calvin says, beats me, isn't that weird? So here you have a, uh, a, a conservation failure of a different kind. Finally, after adolescence, according to Piaget, children pass through a stage called formal operations, or uh, which is characterized by abstract reasoning. Now, not only does the child master concepts such as one operation can undo another, one change can be compensated for by another, one trait can be conserved even as another one changes. Kids kind of get that down during the concrete operational period, as long as they're talking about stuff, uh, real physical things. During the formal operational period, the child can do that with abstract symbols uh, and can manipulate ideas in the same way that they manipulate uh, objects. So here would be, here's an example of a, an achievement during the formal operational period. Suppose, just suppose there's a place where everything is made out of plastic. Are there ovens made out of plastic? Now a child in the concrete operational stage might say, well no, you can't have an oven that's made out of plastic because then it would melt. A child, an, uh, an adolescent in the formal operational period will say, well, yes, because everything there is made out of plastic. You just said so. The child can accept a counterfactual world defined by a set of propositions and deduce everything that is true by virtue of those uh, assumptions and the operations that are made available, sequestering that problem-solving situation from their knowledge of the real world. Now, uh, the Piaget system, like many grand schemes in psychology, is fascinating and elegant and in many ways beautiful, uh, but it has, like the other grand systems, a number of shortcomings. One of them is that the culmination of development, according to Piaget, the formal operational stage, uh, may be more characteristic of a college graduate in a industrialized Western country than a typical member of Homo sapiens. This was made clear uh, many decades ago when a Russian neuropsychologist, Alexander Luria, tried some Piaget-like tasks with uh, uh, fully grown Russian peasants early in the 20th century. Not educated, but obviously cognitively developed. So for example, uh, Luria would ask them, uh, pose a, a problem like this. All bears are uh, white where there is always snow. In Novaya Zemlya, there is always snow. What color are the bears there? Well, you can kind of figure out what the correct answer is if you have taken tests in Western curricula. But the, the Russian peasants would say, well, I've only seen black bears and I do not talk of what I have not seen. Lori continues, but what do my words imply? And not unreasonably, the peasant says, if a person has not been there, he cannot say anything on the basis of words. If a man was 60 or 80 and had seen a white bear there and told me about it, uh, he could be believed. Now, uh, Piaget would classify this fully grown man as not having outgrown the concrete operational stage of cognitive development. That seems a little weird way of putting it. It's a perfectly functioning adult, and it may be that the formal operational stage is a set rather than the culmination of cognitive development, is a particular feat of uh, Western schooling, of forgetting everything you know, uh, telling a person who asks a question something that they already know. Weird cognitive habits, but ones that are, of course, indispensable in the particular context of Western schooling. Let me give you one other example. What do dogs and rabbits have in common? Think about it. I'm sure you're all capable of answering that question. Uh, and a typical answer would be you, you use dogs to hunt rabbits. That is a kind of a narrative association. What situation would they both be in rather than the abstract category? They are both uh, animals or they're both mammals. What do a fish and crow have in common? Absolutely nothing. A fish lives in the water. A crow flies. If a fish just lies on top of the water, the crow would peck at it. 
A crow can eat a fish, but a fish can't eat a crow. Now again, these are not stupid answers. They are quite sensible in the context of sharing your knowledge about the world. They don't count as formal operations because they don't restrict themselves to the operations made available within a, an artificial formal system, which is absolutely necessary for schooling, uh, not uh, in many concrete contexts of everyday life. So Piaget may have mistaken uh, Western schooling for the highest level of uh, cognitive development. He overestimated adults' knowledge. At the same time, he may have underestimated kids' knowledge at the other end of the scale. You get a sense with some of these tasks that children are given that they're kind of trick questions, like you spread the pennies apart and you say uh, which is uh, which now has more. Well, the child could have been engaged in the cooperative principle in pragmatics. Again, I'm alluding to a concept I introduced in the previous lecture on how language is used in context. Namely, you give the benefit of the doubt to the person that you're having a conversation with. You assume that they're asking something that's sensible in context. And it could be when the adult spreads apart the pennies and says, well, now which one has more? The child doesn't literally think there are more pennies, but just that that's got to be the right answer. Also, since Piaget assayed the state of the child's mind in terms of what the child did, uh, it always runs into the problem that children might know more than they're showing, but they may have various kind of habits or memory limitations that means that they can't quite show off what they know uh, simply by looking at what they do. And Piaget, to his credit, began his studies in the 1930s, mainly by starting by observing his own uh, two kids, and he discovered a, an astonishing number of fascinating demos without the fancy labs that we now have. But without those labs, it's often hard to know that if a child can't is doing something, it means that they are clueless about what how the world works. Also, there is uh, a, a kind of fudge factor built into Piaget's theory. He called it décalage, uh, namely when a cognitive feat in one domain is out of sync with a similar feat in a, another domain. According to his theory of stages, uh, er, a logical achievement, like an operation that undoes another operation or something that changes uh, one attribute while leaving others conserved, they ought to change across the board. So for example, a child who can uh, use uh, both the active and passive voice of a sentence, the dog bit the cat, the cat was bitten by the dog, you could say, well, that's conservation of meaning across the operation of changing word order. That child should also solve the task of um, pouring same quantity of water from a short fat beaker into a tall skinny beaker, but it turns out they don't. Kids can use the passive years before they can solve conservation of, uh, of uh, substance. Um, Piaget said, well, that's décalage, but the problem is if there's décalage all over the place, then the stages of development aren't very helpful, and there's an awful lot of décalage. There is an alternative way of uh, approaching cognitive development, one that has more uh, support today among cognitive developmental scientists, sometimes called domain specificity. The idea is that developmental processes don't apply across the board. There are different domains, that is areas of knowledge. You can think of them as modules or as different intuitive theories or different ways of knowing or different intelligences that apply to different aspects of the world. Each one may be defined as some core principles, some just general ways of analyzing experience in that domain, perhaps innate or at least acquired very, very early, that then helps to organize learning going forward, which then consists of the accumulation of an awful lot of acquired knowledge, learned piece by piece separately within each of these domains. What do I mean by domains? Well, there could, we could have an intuitive physics that is a general sense of how objects bounce and roll and fall and break, driven by the core intuition that the world contains objects which obey certain laws. Uh, 
pretty soon I'll uh, be more specific about what those uh, concepts of objects consist of and those, those laws, but they are very different from, say, our intuitive psychology, where when we interact with other people, we don't treat them just as hunks of matter, as, as robots or wind-up dolls, but as you might recall, going way back to the lecture on behaviorism and its shortcomings, we attribute mental states to other people. We assume that they have beliefs and desires. Other people have minds, and we only make sense of what people do by our assumptions of what they know and what they want. That's not how we deal with a glass that falls off a ta table. Uh, we don't treat a person like a glass. We don't treat a glass like a person. We might also have a kind of intuitive biology, how we deal with the living world, where the core intuition there is that living things have an, an internal essence. They're made out of a special stuff which determines their form and organizes their behavior. That's why if you see an animal eating a plant and keeling over, you suspect that there's some kind of poison inside that plant, and you might even extract the poison from the plant. You assume that the way what makes a plant a plant is the internal organization of its tissues and cells. We have yet another domain of knowledge, of intuitive design or engineering or artifacts or tool making, where we make sense of things in terms of their function, what they were designed to do. The activity of reverse engineering that I introduced in the lecture on uh, evolution. Now it's clear that we, we distinguish these things. So for example, the distinction between intuitive biology and intuitive physics is something you can appreciate if you, say, contrast what happens when you throw a uh, dead bird in the air. Well, as Richard Dawkins pointed out, it will describe a graceful parabola and come to rest on the ground. Whereas if you throw a live bird in the air, it won't describe a graceful parabola and come to land on the ground, but it may not touch land this side of the county boundary. We're not surprised because we don't expect living things to obey the same laws as inanimate objects, they obey their own laws. Uh, we distinguish, for example, intuitive biology from intuitive design in terms of how we understand uh, artifacts as opposed to living things. If you want to know how a, what makes a plant uh, do planty things, grow and, uh, uh, and so on, you might take a bit of the plant and look at it under a microscope. That seems like a perfectly sensible thing to do. But if you wanted to understand how chairs work, you wouldn't take a little piece of chair and put it under uh, a microscope. You assume that the chair has been organized with a human goal in mind and that its structure and arrangement are what's relevant to its powers. So these are ways in which we think fundament in fundamentally different ways about different aspects of our experience. And in the domain specificity approach, children are studied in terms of the timetables and the uh, core knowledge by which they organize these different aspects of reality. So let me give you an example from intuitive physics. The main challenge, if you're not content to just seeing what kids do, but you want to kind of probe what they're thinking, the big challenge with the baby is they can't talk. They can't obey instructions. They're rather uncooperative in a, in a lot of ways. But one thing that kids are very good at doing at all ages is getting bored. And boredom can then be used as a kind of assay as to what the child is expecting. The logic is as follows. You show a uh, child a an event that is partly hidden behind a screen over and over again, and you do it until the baby visibly gets bored, they start to, to uh, look away. Now you remove the screen, and for half the babies it shows one thing, for the other half the babies in the study it shows something else. It's a way of probing what the child was expecting behind the screen all along. If when the child sees event A, they continue to be bored, whereas if they see event B, they perk up and continue to stare, that's an indication that they're kind of expecting A all, all along. So it's a way of probing what the child was expecting, even though they can't see it, it's behind a, a uh, screen, and a way, therefore, of doing cognitive psychology on preverbal babies. 
Again, I had mentioned in the lecture on language that language and thought are not the same thing. One example being that babies, before they can speak, are able to think, and it is the habituation technique that's one of the methods that uh, tells us that. I'll give you an example. This comes from my colleague, uh, Professor Elizabeth Spelke in the Department of Psychology here at Harvard, who is one of the pioneers in this area of cognitive development. And Professor Spelke has argued that one of the uh, core bits of knowledge that children are uh, born with is the concept that the world contains objects. This is again contrary to Piaget who argued that uh, when something disappears kids uh, don't know it exists, they have to late in childhood learn that there is such a thing as an object. Uh, Spelke argues that that's one of the things that allow children to learn. So here's a, an experiment she did early in, in uh, her career illustrating the habituation technique. Kids see a, uh, two cylindrical segments moving back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, although the middle uh, part of the visual field is obscured by a screen. Now the screen is removed and half the kids see a uh, uh, cohesive rod. Half the kids see two rods that are uh, just happen to continue to move in synchrony. And both of these are consistent with what they saw during the habituation phase when they started to get bored. But uh, perhaps not surprisingly to you and me, this is much more interesting to a child after the screen has been removed than that. It's as if the child were to say, well, yeah, of course, that's what there was a continuous rod behind the screen. Uh, that's exactly what I expect. Uh, when they see that, it's like, what the hell is going on there? I thought that there was a single object. Or another way of putting it is that the um, common motion is something that children assume to be true of solid objects. Uh, Spelke calls this cohesion, parts of an object move together, part of their core knowledge, their intuitive physics about what an object consists of. There's another principle that she calls continuity that objects follow continuous spatio-temporal trajectories. They don't disappear or reappear uh, or uh, pass through one another. And a uh, classic demonstration of that was done by uh, one of uh, Spelke's uh, former students, now an eminent uh, cognitive developmental psychologist, one of my undergraduate classmates, uh, Professor René Bayergeon. And uh, here is her uh, famous demonstration. The baby watches a, um, a, a kind of a drawbridge, you know, rising and lowering, rising and lowering. And when the drawbridge is lowered, the baby can see a block behind it. And the uh, drawbridge goes up to a perpendicular position, then down. That gets boring fast if you're a baby. Then one of two changes happens. In one case, the uh, the, the drawbridge, the platform, continues to uh, lean back and stops exactly where it should stop if it were blocked by that object that the baby was seeing. In another case, it thanks to a little bit of subterfuge, it continues to pass through the space where the block should be. Now, in neither of these cases can the baby actually see the block anymore. It's all a memory from what they saw when the drawbridge was uh, leaning forward, but in the case where the drawbridge passes through the space where the baby saw a solid object previously, the baby looks a lot longer, as is shown in this cartoon by the, uh, the, the, the gaping jaw. Now, uh, the, this is uh, shown at a very tender age, three to four months, and at that age, the, it's before babies can even reach for things. It's way before they're walking, way, way before they are talking or understanding or hearing anything uh, explained to them. So Piaget's favorite explanation that it's manipulation of the world that allows children to understand things would seem to be ruled out. And uh, Bergeon and Spelke suggest that the core ob concept of an object is either uh, innate or learned uh, very uh, quickly and without the benefit of manipulation. However, 
there's a lot more in physics than just there exist objects, needless to say, and other pretty intuitive concepts for us, like things fall and you push them and they keep going and they need to be supported, uh, they take sometimes take a while to be developed. And I will show how we know that from a, another set of experiments that uh, René Bargeon did. This is a from the Scientific American's Frontier show in her laboratory at the University of uh, Illinois. Just down the hall from Carl, Rene Bayerjohn is finding out when that sense of the possible begins to develop. Rene's group puts on magic shows for babies, with results that have astonished her colleagues around the world. Each show tests whether babies know some basic physical rule, that objects can't just disappear, for example. knowledge, they will be puzzled or surprised or intrigued by our magical events. And we know when babies are surprised or puzzled, they tend to scrutinize the events, to look and look and look at them. And so what we do in our experiments is compare infants' responses to magical events and non-magical or real events to see whether they look longer at the magical than at the real ones. As Holly's attention is captured, a hidden observer starts the timer. This time it's a non-magical normal event. The three-month-old is soon bored. She looks away and the clock is stopped. Now for the impossible or magical event. stares. She really scrutinizes the event. That means she's surprised. Even at three months, she knows the world doesn't work this way. Backstage, there's a simple explanation. Two dolls moved independently. But Holly is riveted and even startled by such an illogical sight. many trials, three-month-olds have been consistently surprised by the disappearing doll trick. They all seem to understand it's not possible. But take a look at the next result. Babies like Felix, who were just two weeks older, were not surprised. that their worldview was more sophisticated. These babies spontaneously came to the conclusion that we were using two different objects, two minis, to produce the event. And so what we did to test this interpretation was to lower the screen at the start of each event. We say, mm -mm, no, this is not what's going on here. Okay, he thinks, I see they've got just one doll up there. But unknown to Felix, when the arch is raised, the second doll is slipped back in. And once again, these slightly older babies were back to being surprised. Which seems to confirm Renee's conclusion that they had figured out the original trick. In the box experiment, Renee's been testing what babies know about falling. Three-month-olds, like Holly, don't find the non-magical event interesting. They soon look away. But in the magical variation... That's much more interesting. Really worth staring at. So it seems that by three months, babies have learned that unsupported things should fall. Once again, there was a twist to the story. Slightly older babies usually weren't upset when the box just hung in midair. Now it was the researchers' turn to be surprised. We were very, very puzzled by that result. And 
And it actually took us weeks and weeks and months of thinking through what could be going on and trying all kinds of different hypotheses until finally one day we came to this idea that, my goodness, what if they thought that somehow the finger, which was the only thing in contact with the box, had become attached to it? And that's why they weren't surprised. They were generating an explanation, in this case an incorrect one, but a, a sort of relatively plausible one for the box's failure to fall. To test this explanation, they changed the trick so that the finger lost contact with the box. And sure enough, the babies were once again startled by the sight. Absolutely remarkable that such little babies, when shown our surprising events, you know, are actively thinking about what we show them and actively searching for and finding explanations for what they see. I think it really gives us a fascinating insight into what babies are doing when they look at the world around them. Now, as I mentioned, for uh, all of the sophisticated ways we have expectations about physical objects, they don't work when it comes to entities with minds, that is to say, other people. And our theory of mind, this is a term that refers not to a scientist's or psycho psychologist's theory, but to the intuitive or folk theory that uh, everyone carries around with them to interpret other people's behavior, something that develops with different milestones on a slightly different uh, trajectory. I emphasized, again, that belief, desire, explanations are critical in making sense of uh, uh, our fellows, and a, a particularly demanding test of our ability to attribute beliefs to others comes from a famous task called the False Belief Test, task, sometimes called the Sally Ann uh, test, comparing the abilities of three-year-olds and four-year-olds. So here's the way uh, it works. This is a bird's eye view of a uh, developmental psychology lab. Here is the child. Here is the experimenter. You're looking down at a table. There are two dolls, Sally and Ann. Sally places her marble in a basket. Then Salet, Sally exits. Then Anne uh, takes the marble from Sally's basket and puts it in her box. Sally re-enters, and you ask the child, where will Sally look for her marble? And a three-year-old child will say, we'll look in the box. Now, you and I know that, that can't be right, because the, we know that the marble is in the box, but Sally was out of the room. Sally has no way of knowing. We know that what Sally knows is not the same thing as what we know, but a three-year-old uh, can't keep them straight. With a, according to a three-year-old, what you know is known. Everyone knows it. And there is no uh, separate, uh, separate um, record or representation of what she knows and what he knows and what she knows separate from what I know. Four-year-olds have no trouble. They can, uh, time after time, say, well, she'll look in the basket because that's where it was when she last saw it. The, uh, this has led to an, an enormous and fascinating body of research of how children conceptualize other minds, demonstrated in um, uh, get more elaborate uh, experimental uh, preparations, in this case by uh, the psychologist Janet Astington. We're going to have snacks now. What are you about to get? Nothing demonstrates that better than a simple but startling experiment Janet Astington, also at the University of Toronto, does with three-year-olds like Jacob and a juice box. What's in the box? Juice. <laughs> Look at that. What are they? Books. Hmm. Jacob calls the ribbons ropes, which is fine, because it's the next question that counts. What did you think was inside the box before I turned it over? Ropes. Ropes. 
it's surprising when you think, well, surely they can remember. You know, they just said juice a moment ago. It's really surprising when they say that they thought that there were ribbons in there. And you realize that they, they do, they just don't think about the world in the same way that we do. Okay, sorry, Jacob. I just Not only is Jacob now convinced he always thought there were ropes in the box, he also believes if he thinks something, so must everyone else. Jesse hasn't seen inside this box. What would Jesse think is inside before I turn it over? Ropes. The innocence of the three-year-old mind is both wonderful and a little spooky. And it's led Toronto's Tom Keenan and David Olson to play an elaborate game to find out if young children understand deception. One of the players is three-year-old Ross. So, this is John, and this is his big sister, Katie, and that's John's mother, John and Katie's mother. And I want you to pretend that they're real people, just like you and me, okay? Now, look at John. John has big feet, and Katie, Katie has little feet. Now, watch what happens when they walk through the flower. They make footprints. Okay. Do you see the footprints they make? Now, can you tell me which footprints are John's footprints? Which ones did he make? That's right. Those are John's footprints. Okay, now can you point to Katie's footprints? Which ones did Katie make? Very good. Okay, now, what we're going to do is I'm going to tell you a little story about Katie and John. I just have to take their shoes off. The story takes place in the family's kitchen. Mom spilled flour all over the floor while baking the muffins that John and Katie now can't wait to eat. So they ask Mom if they can have some muffins. But Mom says, you can't have muffins right now. Dinner's almost ready. So Katie and John go back to their bedroom. Now, Mom hears the phone ring. So she goes downstairs to answer the phone. And when she's downstairs, she can't see us and she can't hear us, okay? Okay, now, you know what Katie does? Katie decides she's going to take some muffins. So here comes Katie. But before she takes the muffins, she puts on John's great big shoes. Tom spells out for Ross exactly why Katie switches shoes. So here goes Katie. She put on John's shoes so she'll leave big footprints in the flower and so that the mom will think John took the muffins. Okay? So here she goes. Now Katie grabs the muffins eats them all up. Now, Katie hears her mother coming back, so she runs off to the bedroom. Now, here comes Mom. Now, Mom sees that the muffins are all gone. And Mom also sees the big footprints in the flower. Now, can you tell me who ate the muffins? Which one ate the muffins? Was it Katie or was it John? Katie. Right. Did Mom see Katie eat the muffins? No, she didn't, did she? Okay, now are there big or little footprints in the flower? Are those the big ones or the little ones? Big ones. They're the big ones, okay. So they're John. Okay, so who will Mom think ate the muffins? Will she think it was Katie or will she think it was John? Katie. Okay. Despite apparently following the logic of the story every step of the way, Ross still can't see that Mom doesn't know what he knows. This belief that thoughts in your head are somehow public knowledge, that what you think everyone thinks, is almost the definition of childish innocence. Watch this wonderful example with psychologist Joan Peskin and three-year-old Jacob. You're going to choose one of the stickers, and he's going to choose one of the stickers. But he always chooses first, and he always wants the one that you really want. He doesn't care if you're sad. Let's put Monkey into another room so that he doesn't know which sticker you really want. Okay, you tell me, which sticker do you really like? Which sticker do you not want? Okay, now I'm going to bring back Mean Monkey, and he's going to choose first. Remember, he always wants the sticker that you really want. He doesn't care if you're sad. So think of what you can do or say so that he doesn't get the one that you really want. Here comes Mean Monkey. Hmm. Which sticker am I going to choose? Um, Jacob, which sticker do you really want? Oh, 
Well, then I'm going to take that one. So you get to take this one. Joan repeats the experiment several times with each child, giving them ample opportunity to deceive the monkey as to what they really want. Okay, tell me which sticker you really like. That one. And which sticker do you not want? That one. Okay. Um, Jacob, which sticker are you going to take? Well, then I'm going to take that one. And you Bravely accepting, three-year-old Jacob never figures out that the monkey can be fooled. But what about Patrick, 18 months older, and already with a knowing gleam in his eyes? So that he doesn't know which sticker you really want, okay? Which one do you really like? Point to which one you really like. That one. And which sticker do you really not want? Which is a yucky sticker? That one. Okay. We'll leave those stickers there, and I'm going to bring in Mean Monkey. Hmm, let me see which one I want. Patrick, which one do you really like? Oh, well then I'm going to take that one, and you get to have that one. I have my fingers crossed. <laughs> Patrick has also crossed a threshold into the adult world. He's now old enough to know that he can think things that others don't. That his thoughts are his alone. From about four and a half to five, they suddenly and rapidly get that knowledge. They begin to think about other people's thoughts. They begin to think that somebody can think something different from what they know. That people's thoughts vary, are private, um, may be incorrect. People can have false thoughts about something that they know to be true. Once you understand that, then you can explain all sorts of things about why people do things which seem strange to you. They're looking for things and you know that that's not where they are. It also means then that you can understand how to surprise people, how to trick people, because once you've made this split between the mind and the world, then you can think about people's minds and manipulate the way the world is so that they come to believe certain things about it. And you now have an explanation for the uh, end of innocence. So three-year-olds uh, fail the false belief task. You saw a number of manifestations over there. Four-year-olds pass it. Now, it would be too simplistic just to say that uh, three-year-olds think that other people are wind-up dolls, that they have no understanding of other minds as well. They do have trouble keeping distinct what they know and what other people know. That is the contrary states of the world known by themselves and another mind. But they do have some inkling that even at the age of three, even at the age of two, that there are such things as minds. For one thing, they use verbs like think and know, which pertain to mental states. And they can pass simpler theory of mind tasks that don't pose quite the demand on keeping in mind two contradictory states of events, one of which you know to be true, the other the state of belief of someone else. Uh, simple example, you've got Sally who touches the box, you've got Anne who looks inside the box, which one knows uh, what is in the box. And even three-year-olds say that Anne knows what's in the box, Sally doesn't, indicating that they have some sense uh, of what knowing consists of. They also have some sense of what wanting consists of. If you ask the child, um, here is Charlie, which chocolate will Charlie take? Well, they correctly indicate that he'll take the one that he's looking at, because people tend to look at things that they want, uh, even at the age of three. Now, one more not so obvious implication of the idea that the uh, theory of mind or intuitive psychology is a distinct domain of knowing is what happens when it is uh, absent or uh, defective. And that is one explanation for the fascinating syndrome known as autism, made famous to many people by the movie with Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman called Rain Man. Autism in its more extreme forms 
it shows itself when children are socially unresponsive and detached. They don't interact with other people, including their parents. They are uh, captivated by objects, but not people, and they treat people as objects. They might run over a uh, person on the beach the same way they would run over a, a, a rug. Uh, even older autistic children, in, in, indeed in, uh, even autistic adults, fail the theory of mind tasks. The all of them, the Sally Ann task, uh, the uh, which one knows what's in the box, what chocolate bar will Charlie, Charlie uh, pick. And so a hypothesis is that one of the distinctive cognitive uh, deficiencies in severe autism is a defective or uh, inefficient theory of mind module, an absence of intuitive psychology. Even though people with autism uh, often are perfectly capable of reasoning about the physical world, things uh, that don't have minds in the first place. So some key points in this lecture on cognitive development is the distinction, include the distinction between altricial and precocial species, the mechanisms of developmental change, namely learning, maturation, including the maturation of the nervous system, the uh, development of neurons, of synapses, and of myelin, critical periods as a developmental uh, mechanism that is neither completely learning nor completely maturation. I introduce you to the system of thought of Jean Piaget, a domain general developmental theory applying across everything that the child comes to know. Contrasted it with the more popular domain specificity approach, the idea that we come to master different intuitive theories, each of which is organized around a core idea or intuition, but different ones for our intuitive physics, our intuitive psychology, our intuitive biology, and our intuitive engineering. I explained some of the milestones in the development of intuitive physics and baby's concepts of objects, and of our milestones in intuitive psychology and children's theory of mind.